Who are you going to call is something everyone, I think, in the whole wide world can finish that phrase. And I'm going to call Ray Parker Jr. because he's the man who wrote that song. It's a very famous song, but he's so much more than that. Welcome, Ray. Nice to have you on the show. Yeah, it's good to be here. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because uh, so many of us get defined by one thing in our careers if we're lucky enough, right? And so yeah. that's, that's the, the definition of Ray Parker Jr. was that one song. But this new documentary that, that's coming out about you really tells us a complete story. Tell me about the, how that all got started. Well, it all got started because the director did this movie called Hired Gun, and I was a part of that movie. And we were doing some promotion. So while on the way to and from Australia, which is an 18-hour plane ride, wow. you know, we, got to, we got to talk about a lot of things. And he says, well, I want to do your story next. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah and, and it is very interesting. I mean, let's... Let's go back to growing up in Detroit, because I think when you think about, uh, you know, the time when we were both kids, it was a volatile time. Things were happening, and, and oh, yeah. it's a dangerous place to grow up. Yeah, very dangerous place to grow up. In fact, you know, it's, it's interesting. Right now with all this virus stuff, me and my wife, we go walk around the park, and then, you know, when somebody comes at us, you know, they walk across the street or they change sides of the street. I looked at my wife, I said, I'm used to that. That's how I grew up, people walking on the other side of the street, you know, if I came along. <laughs> yeah, isn't that something? Yeah, everybody's got their masks on. and We're yeah. all trying to do a responsible thing. But, I mean, in, in one of the stories that's it's, it's in your documentary that I saw a little piece of uh, talks about you getting, uh, getting in a confrontation with the police when you really had, we were just walking down the street. Yeah, just going to school, getting ready to get on the bus and go to school. And uh, yeah, that happened a few times in Detroit. So it was a different, different bringing up, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And and somewhere along the line, because you were a, you're an artist, and you were an artist at your core when you even when you first started, you picked up uh, was it a guitar or a clarinet first? Clarinet first. <laughs> yeah, I had to switch from that. Too much blowing, you know. The, the, the clarinet leads to the saxophone, so I, I took some saxophone too. But I got to tell you, nice instrument, just too much blowing for me. I like <laughs> to hit the chords on the guitar, and you can sing at the same time or talk to the girls at the same time. You can't do that when you got a big horn in your mouth. You just can't do it. You know? <laughs> That's true. But, you know, the saxophone is like one of the sexiest instruments around, right? Well, I think the guitar is sexier. <laughs> uh, well, I agree. I play the guitar, too, so I agree. There you go. <laughs> I mean, there's nothing like it. And so, so the, the fact is that not a lot of kids in the 60s, and I was one of them, I picked yeah. up a guitar because I played, I, you know, I wanted to play rock and roll music. I want to be like the Beatles. I wanted to play, you know, the, yeah, the, absolutely. The stuff. And, and my dad was a musician and he wanted me to learn mariachi music, which is what I ended up playing. So <laughs> that was fun. But you, I mean, at a very young age became at, at 12 years old, you're walking into Motown. Who can do that? Yeah. Well, I didn't know I could do it either, but uh, we got to play with uh, the spinners. It was the group I played with. And I was a little bit, unhappy because they weren't as known that they only had one hit record Motown. Yeah. They weren't really as known. Who would know that they go to Philadelphia and become like the spinners of, you know, tons and tons and tons of hit albums. But at that time, Billy Henderson was real kind to me. He had a, a chart called fascinating rhythm and it was a jazz chart. And he said, if you can read this chart, I don't care how young you are, you can have the gig, you know? So I read the chart. I got the gig. <laughs> That's a, how old were you then? I was like 13. Oh my gosh. I mean, that's like a dream come true. And uh, because a lot of us were hoping to get to 17 so we could play in a real rock band and play in clubs and, and lie about our age. And here you oh, are, yeah. 30 years old. How'd you manage that? Yeah, well, here's about the clubs. I used to be in clubs religiously ever since I was 13, 14. And my father would take me to the clubs and they would let me in as long as I wouldn't, you know, order a drink or something. <laughs> I had some supervision. You know, somebody would say, hey, he's going to sit on the stage with us and play. It was like the band was sort of special, off limits. You know, the police wouldn't come in and mess with you. And so, yeah, I was in nightclubs ever since I was 13, 14, like every night of the week, just about. So they're saying, you know, because Stevie Wonder was one of the people that you worked with. And, and they said, well, Stevie is a wonder. He's an amazing musician. But to be doing what you're doing, equally amazing. Tell me about that collaboration with you and Stevie. Well, first of all, Stevie had heard about me from, I guess, Marvin Gaye and Smokey Robinson and Bo Hamilton, Bo Hamilton, all the people I worked with at Motown. And when he called me up, it couldn't have been a better time. I was in my first year of college, and I graduated early at 17. So I was, you know, 17 years old in my first year of college. 
Wow. They had me drafting car parts, which I just hated car parts, right? Uh, you know, I, I told my dad, I, I just want to drive a car. I want to build it, you know? <laughs> and so Stevie Wonder called me right in the middle of college while I was having just a rough time. And he's telling me things like, well, I want you to come to San Francisco with me. We're going to cut a record on Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. Then we're going to go to L.A. and we're going to finish a talking book album. And then we're going to go to New York and we're going on tour with the Rolling Stones. Well, I thought that was a better idea than, <laughs> you know, in school doing what I was doing because I was on a, a dead-end path, I think. <laughs> so there was no, no, no backup plan in your life. You were headlong a musician. You're going to play guitar. No, I was headlong. Yeah, I wanted to do it. I mean, in fact, I tell kids when I'm at schools, I think you should burn the B plan. <laughs> <laughs> Be no B plan, right? No, this is this is like the military. We cross the bridge. We we blow the bridge up after we cross it, right? <laughs> and we're full steam ahead. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the Godfather, uh, the, uh, the the Ghostbusters. I almost said the Godfather, another one of my favorite. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so so you were nominated for an Academy Award for the Ghostbusters movie and lost out to your pal Stevie that same year. Yeah, how about that? Well, <laughs> you know, the other thing, if you got to lose your award, that's a good person to lose it to and i gotta tell you i got a bad feeling that if i had taken his first academy award i don't know if we'd be friends still <laughs> <laughs> well, that is terrific so what are we going to learn in this documentary that perhaps we have never learned about you before well the first thing you're going to learn is that anything is possible because i came from the inner city and you know made things work and the second thing is you're going to learn is there's more to rate than just who you're going to call yeah yeah, that's true, isn't it? That's so true. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just list off the people that I know that you work with. Barry White, Stevie Wonder, The Rolling Stones, The Carpenters, Rufus and Shaka Khan. By the way, I love that song, uh, You Got the Love. That, that okay, groove, thank you. That guitar groove at the beginning is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, also, uh, of course, The Supremes, Aretha. And tell me about Clive Davis's ear for the things that you like to do. Tell me about that relationship with you. Yeah, we got along really, really well because our first meeting, you know, I had written that song, You Make Me Feel Like Dancing and got no credit for it. You know, only one song of the year. And then I had another tune called Jack and Jill that he just loves. So when I when, when we met, you know, most people would meet, and I'll, I'll never forget the meeting. Most people would meet and they'd say, oh, well, I want an advance. When do I get my new car? All that kind of stuff. And he said, all I asked him for was, I want to be on this radio station, this radio station, <laughs> and this radio station. I never did ask him for any money, right? And, you know, I told him I had my own studio in the house and I had all my own stuff. I just want to cut the record and get it on the radio. And so we, ever since then, we were really good friends. You know, he thought that was admirable of me and I thought it was admirable of him. And he said he delivered what I've delivered. Well, he, he, then that leads me to, I think, the best part of this and that, and that I've learned about you is that in the music business, there's no better businessman than Ray Parker Jr., and well, I don't, he, I don't know about that. <laughs> that dude. Now, that's true. A lot of people say that. Yeah. <laughs> Is that your well, parents brought you up that way to, to, to appreciate money and a good deal? My dad did, yeah. And again, I, I, I think you're right. I do appreciate money and a good deal. But at the same time, I'm not a genius because I, I wasted a lot of opportunities and a lot of money in the past. I guess that's what you call life, you know, <laughs> having yeah, a good time. Yeah. But uh, well, I've always told people, I said, what makes me look like a genius is because I'm a musician and I didn't get rid of all of it. <laughs> you know, I kept a little <laughs> bit of it. <laughs> so in my land, if you keep a third of it, you look like a genius. You know? uh, so, Ray, when can we uh, see the moot with the, the film? Is it out yet? It's not out yet. And we were hoping to have it out by now. But I want to release my film at the same time as the new Ghostbusters film. And I want to release my new album at the same time as the documentary. So I think everything has been pushed back to 2021. Well, okay. Well, yeah. And our lives have certainly changed and uh, I hope you're well and everybody's safe in your family. Yeah. That's the same thing here. I hope everybody's well in your family and I hope I'm here in 2021 <laughs> to put the <laughs> film out. I mean, these guys are like, you know, all this virus and this other stuff going on. It's, everything's in question. You know? Well, the only thing that's not in question is your talent and your contribution to music. Thank you, Ray Parker Jr., for being with us on Carlos and Lisa. It's a pleasure to meet you, pleasure to speak with you, and continued success, my friend. Well, thank you very much. And since you're so close to me, hopefully I come to the studio next time. Yeah, yeah, I'd love yeah. to have you along. <laughs>